So I did the maths, I've been writing production level code for almost 6,000 hours now. And while reflecting on it, I thought, what advice would I give to somebody starting at the beginning? But if I'd known, I could have got to where I am now much faster. This ended up being quite a long list. If you click the link in the description, I'll email you the whole thing. But in this video, I'll give you the three highest leverage ones that get you more than 80% of the way there. I'll be covering what the old adage, work smart and not hard, looks like for software engineers, how to never stop improving, and I'll point out the bad habits that I've seen kill careers and hold me back from progressing much faster than I could have if I'd been aware of them. There's quite a lot of productivity guru comments on this concept of work smart and not harder, and even memes that are all over YouTube, but they're quite generic and not really focused for software engineering. I think the main thing it boils down to is time now versus time later. Your main goal at work is probably that you want to sit there and code, solving problems, getting in the meat of it, but there ends up being a lot of things that get in the way. You have optional or required meetings that you have to attend to. Maybe you're a part of a team where you have to review your colleagues' code. Maybe your company has quite complex business knowledge that you need to learn. I know a thing that's really been catching me recently is setting up different environments, different VMs for different test setups, even the test data itself. And all of these things can, if you let them, blow out and take up time, but really, unless you're managing people, you should be just trying to increase your output, and increasing your output is more time doing code. So, what can we do about this? All of these things need doing, it's not like you can just <laughs> take your calendar from 9am to 5pm and say, right, okay, that's just gonna be code, because like we just said, these need doing. Well, I'm gonna make the case that we wanna be prioritizing code. So first of all, if you are gonna be putting in a calendar, just a quick aside, work out when you work best. There's some people that when they get into work at 9 a.m., they're ready to go, they're firing all cylinders, you know? If that's the case, let's, you, you, and we work in a schedule thing, you'd put code right at the top, and then all of the admin stuff right at the end. For meetings, is gonna be something that's difficult to get around. I think people have this assumption that showing up to every meeting is optimal for their career, but in reality, show up to your required meetings, and for optional meetings, only do it if you think it's gonna be more high leverage than you saying to your boss, right, we've pushed the sprint ahead, because he probably wants to hear that more than that you sat muted without your camera up at a bunch of meetings that weren't really that relevant to you. You're a software engineer, you're a problem solver. What I wanna see is this thing shrink and your time coding expand. And the only way we're gonna do that while getting the same amount of work done is optimizing our workflows. The upfront cost might be that, okay, we have terrible workflows and we need to start dedicating a bit extra time for system making so that we can decrease this time. But if this is only a week that this takes to, to squash down most of the things that are burning your time that aren't coding, then it's worth it. You're gonna be working in software for longer than a week. Do the upfront hard work now so that things are easier in the future. Okay, so what does it, this look like in practice? Upfront cost, pay it. If there's something that you think, ah, oh, this could be done a lot easier in the future, I'm going to be doing this a lot, and you can do a bit of work now so that you can do less work later, do it. If it means, you know, learning Docker so you can standardize your test environment so that the next time that your boss asks you to test what you've made, you can do it in five minutes instead of waiting an hour for, for a database to back up, that's probably optimal. If it means making some flashcards, if you've got the business knowledge that you need to know memorized instead of having to refer back to that PDF that you were handed a few months ago every so often, it's probably worth it. If it means becoming more familiar with DevOps so that you can start get, There's some crazy pipeline automations that you can get, but, but if you look into, yeah, it might take you a couple of days to set up to begin with, but these are all repetitive tasks that we can start squeezing down so that we're spending more time coding. Build systems. I'm assuming at some point in your coding career you've come across some kind of, you've had a requirement to, you've had a requirement where you've had to look into a pathing algorithm. Well, think about the tasks in your job in a similar way. Unless you've seriously thought about it, there's a good chance that you're not doing the worst path or the best path, you're doing the average path. But if you can save half of your time by going the quickest route from A to B, and you're taking that journey every day, or every two days, or three times a week, let's start trying to find it. If there's one thought pattern that will push you towards getting things quick, it, it's Steve Jobs and wearing the same jumper and trousers every day. He took out the complexity so that he wasn't thinking for the things he didn't need to think for, and he was thinking for the things that he did need to. Code is where you want your attention to be. We want the rest to be as seamless as possible. If you frequently need test data, set, set up a Python script that builds it for you and puts it in the places that it needs to be, so that it's as simple as clicking a shortcut on your desktop. If it's dealing with databases, let's have some easy to access script that we can execute without having to find passwords and, and move things around and, 
and look at that folder on your D drive that's within five other folders that you have to thumb through for half an hour just to find what you're looking. The more that you make things faster to get to, the quicker you can get to doing the things that presumably you want to be doing, like coding. The next barrier to your progression that a lot of people fall down the rabbit hole with is the, the issue with the industry being continual development, how fast things become redundant and how much you need to keep on top of what's trending, what's useful, what's high leverage. And it's easy to fall into this grind set trap of, ah, uh, I'll just be like David Goggins. I'll keep doing the pull-ups like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the mountain. Uh, I'll hate my life and I'll just do it all the time until I'm the best of the best. And maybe you stick to it for two weeks and you crash because it's because you hate it. Well, learning doesn't have to be like that. We're not living in the 1400s where you have to sit with a textbook by candlelight and just read from dawn till dusk to keep ahead. If you think about what drives YouTube, it's it's the attention economy, right? People are now financially incentivized to give you good information that's entertaining and interesting. Because if it's not entertaining and interesting, you'll click off and not watch their next video. And if you do that, then they don't get paid. So they have to do two things. One, it has to teach you something or you're not going to come back to them because you haven't learned anything. And two, it has to be interesting because otherwise you're not going to stay on the page. Use YouTube as a tool for learning. I watch this guy called Nick and his content is completely invaluable for me. He's constantly giving high quality, good value content that is relevant to my job and makes me better at it. Sure, if I wanted to get good at C Sharp, I could just read all of, all of the MSDN documentation, but am I really likely to do that? But will I watch a YouTube video on my phone while I'm on a bus? Or having my lunch? Yeah, yeah, of course I will. Now, this is quite a specific example, because if you're not a C Sharp developer, this guy's probably not going to be helpful, but you're guaranteed that whatever language you learn, you're going to have some, you're going to have content creators that bridge the gap well of entertaining and give valuable content. You want to be doing this daily because it's so easy. All you're doing is, what? You give 10, 15 minutes of your time to, to watch a video or two, and you're exposed to you're exposed to how the technology is changing. And then, okay, obviously watching that video isn't enough to have learned it and embedded it. But the point is, is that you work. If you do this for your job, you've now got, when you go to work tomorrow, use it. You're very likely to, to find a problem that can be solved using what you learned in a video. And that's where the, the learning and the retention of that knowledge is going to come from. You're exposed to it in this interesting and and fun way and then I mean you're paid to put it to work but don't just stop there you know like I don't even do JavaScript but I watch this guy because of the way he problem solves this is a guy that's got five more years experience than I have and so when I hear him talk through the way that he solves problems sure the language isn't the same but fundamentally the act of solving problems is and that's just going to help you mature faster as a software engineer but before you go and try and learn everything everything there is to know about your tech stack and and new emerging tools and frameworks there is a pitfall to that way of thinking when you've been working a long time or even when you're trying to learn software to get into the industry it's very easy to get sidetracked from what you need to know to be good at your job master the basic your company probably has some coding some coding standards that that need to be stuck to learn them well because it's so easy to start veering away from it when there's so many exciting different toys and, the, and tricks out there and new patterns that you can learn that your team's never seen. Just because it's new doesn't necessarily mean it's good or better. Even if it's a fraction of a percent more optimal and you could argue it from that perspective, is it easily readable for the rest of your team? Maybe not. Think of all the acronyms that you, that you learn in the cu first couple of months. Keep it simple, that's what I'm saying. You can learn all these flourishes and they're exciting, sure, but realistically there's a time and a place for them and is it something that everybody's going to be familiar with? Maybe not. Yagni, you're not going to need it. It doesn't mean that just because you've learned this, this crazy new factory pattern that now you need to refactor the entire company code base to fit this slightly better and more efficient pattern because your time would probably be better spent pushing out a new feature. Again, if you're object oriented, how solid is your code? Or have you gotten complacent and you're just pushing out things that work before really they're refined to the point that they're production level. And sure, maybe you have mastered these things, but these learned things slip away as time goes on. It's very easy to get worse at coding, and that's why it's not just enough really to master these things. Once you've mastered them, you need to revisit them. And honestly, I think if you focus on these three things of trying to, of optimizing your workflows, lessening the resistance, 
making your learning fun, but also really focusing on the basics. Just because just because you've become advanced doesn't mean that the most advanced solution is the best. These principles really should take up probably 80% of your thinking. Now, like I said, if you want the comprehensive list of all of the extra things that really would add up to becoming an accomplished software engineer, my newsletter's below. And if you want a far better breakdown of how to get truly productive with your time allocation, I've got this video here where I break down with the ultra marathon training and making a YouTube content and also being a full-time software engineer. So hopefully that video helps. Cheers.